Hello and welcome to Dyslexia Explore. Today I have an entrepreneur, a very enterprising man who has dyslexia, and he's going to share his story. And I think you're going to really find this fascinating how he's gone from finding it so frustrating at school and making him feel like he's stupid to the point where in his 20s, 30s, he's written 18 books and built businesses and achieved things the teachers thought he could achieve. So I'd really like to introduce to you Matt Bird. Matt, it's great to have you here. Darius, it's great to be with you and all your listeners. So Matt, I really want to hear your dyslexia journey. And before we hear where your journey began and where you've come to, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Help the audience know a little bit about you. Sure. Well, I live between London in the UK and Sicily in Italy. I travel a lot in between those times. I'm a business and social entrepreneur. Uh, I run a global foundation called Neighbour, helping churches love their neighbours in communities. I run a publishing company called Publish You, helping people write and publish their books. And I run a little property business in Italy, uh, helping people find the perfect holiday and investment property and to refurbish it and we help them manage it afterwards. So those are some of the things I do. But I've got my fingers in a few pies and I love starting things and building things up. Well, that sounds dyslexia orientated. You know, that's a very dyslexic kind of pattern. So tell us a little bit about where your dyslexia journey began. What I'd love to know is like, what was life like before you became aware you had dyslexia and what was the wake up call? What was it a person? Was it an event? What woke you up to the fact that you had dyslexia? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think I realized I was dyslexic until I was in my 20s. And I, I really self diagnosed, I began to read around dyslexia. And I realized that I resonated with so much of the description of what people with dyslexia often experience in life. But prior to that, I just believed I was stupid, which was just an awful thing for anybody. Uh, but at school, I, I didn't do well. School and I didn't get on. School was where I started my first business, but that wasn't in the classroom. That was in break time. Uh, but in the classroom, I didn't do well. In the days that I was at school, my teachers literally thought I was stupid. So they put me in remedial English classes, remedial maths classes. I was told I couldn't do computer studies because my grasp of the English language wasn't good enough. And so I left school, scraped through. Actually, I did have an English teacher. Well, he was a French who taught English. He was my most encouraging uh, teacher that I experienced. And later in life, when I published my first book, I actually reached out to him to try and find out where he was. And I just wanted to thank him, actually, that despite this very challenging experience at school, i would actually published a book and I just wanted to thank him for all the encouragement he gave me. Can you give him a shout out? What's his name? France Alul. And uh, that's very French he is. <laughs> and I couldn't contact him through the school. So I contacted the Department for Education. And I wrote to him in the care of the pensions department and sent him a copy of the book and wrote him a letter. Just, I just wanted to say thank you for all the encouragement he gave me at school. And six months later, I heard from him and we reconnected and he was so encouraged. But yeah, that was, he was just a remarkable person to see potential in somebody that many other people had written off and just thought was stupid. Yeah, so I left school really limited by this, this belief about myself that, that my teachers had told me that I was stupid. And it took me years to overcome that. And whenever I didn't succeed at something, or failed at something, this little voice would say, Matt, it's because you're stupid. Uh, it took a lot of getting over because, you know, when you're a child and uh, adults tell you things, it sticks, doesn't it? Yes. So, and, and, I, and I didn't overcome that overnight. It took me years and years and years. And I'm over it now, but I still have to remind myself, actually, Matt, you're smart, <laughs> you know, and I have to keep telling myself that. So my, my educational experience was very, very difficult apart from this one teacher who saw the potential in me and encouraged me. And then in my 20s, as I said, I, I came across dyslexia and read around it. And I thought, my goodness, 
That's why I struggled at school. And that's why when we did dictation, I was lost in the first sentence, let alone after 20 minutes. I was just, it's why I struggled with the English, let alone a second language. It's why I couldn't process things or remember things in the same way. I'd read a book and I'd had no idea what it said. And I, when everybody around you appears to be learning and you can't learn that way, you just think, well, there's something wrong with me. I'm very similar. I found out when I was in my 30s and very similar experiences and feelings. But one of the things I had to get over was letters didn't jump up and down for me like they said for everyone else that had dyslexia. I thought, well, maybe I'm slightly dyslexic or something like that. But letters didn't jump up for me. But I did have a lot of other difficulties associated with dyslexia. How was it for you? Were, were there any kind of things in your mind that think, well, I couldn't be dyslexic because I can do X, Y, and Z or whatever, you know? No, I, I mean, it was only after my educational experience, my main educational experience that I, looking back, I thought, gosh, this explains that. And I remember being sat with a friend one day and I was due to be speaking at an event or a, a series of events on a subject. And he asked me about what I was going to speak about. And I told him, and he said, Matt, he said, that's a book. I said, pardon? He said, what you're going to speak about is a book. Now, I mean, telling a kid or a young guy, as I was by then, who wrestled for many years to get over the belief he was stupid, to tell them that they had a book in them was, I didn't believe him. <laughs> and how many books have you written now? I think it's 19 now. It's um, fantastic. 19 books. And no so books. what I like to ask folk is the wake up call was reading about dyslexia by the sounds of it. It wasn't a particular person. It was, was it a particular encounter or anything like that? Can you trace it to a moment? Somebody probably said, Matt, you might have dyslexia. But I don't remember that conversation. I just remember something must have triggered me to start reading around dyslexia. And I thought, my goodness, that's describing many of the things that I experience and makes sense of the very difficult time I had at school. And perhaps after all, there wasn't something fundamentally wrong with me. And the crazy thing now is, you know, I've, yeah, I've written 19 books, but I, I actually help other people write books. You know, for years, people used to come to me and say, Matt, will you help me write my book? And I'd always try and help them out because I'm that kind of guy. And then it got so much, I thought, well, why don't I write a course through which I can cope groups of people to write their books? And so there's this kind of dyslexia guy who's not only written books, but, but now I coach you know, over 100 people every year to write their books you know, by following my step-by-step -step methodology. It's fantastic because, you know, what's interesting is if we just take a look back, you know, like so often you think if you've got dyslexia, you can't do X, Y, or Z. If you've got dyslexia, you can't read, but people with dyslexia read. If you've got dyslexia, you can't fill in the dots. But the interesting thing is that it doesn't come to you automatically. You have to be very manual, very intentional, very systematic about it because you can't just rely on your automaticity. You can't just rely on slipping into a habit. It's always conscious and intentional. And I suspect what you've ended up doing is because you've had to be so conscious and intentional about it, whereas other people might be more unconscious and automatic about it, you've created a process and a system that you can then teach other people because you've been so intentional about it. Would that be accurate? Yeah, yeah, I've had to be conscious about how I do things, conscious and deliberate. Whereas many people, they just do things without thinking about it. I have to, I have to think hard about things. Yes. So what would you say is the biggest challenge that dyslexia has brought up in your life? You know, it can be different for different people at different stages, but what have you noticed have been the challenges? I think it's self-esteem. Yeah. How I feel about myself, you know, because there is this, for years I didn't think I was very smart. You know, I literally thought I'm stupid or not very smart. But you know what? I am smart. I'm really smart. And I think for other people now, I'm passionate 
about people with dyslexia and neurodiversity, if you want to use that language. I'm passionate about them not thinking that somehow what they have is a is a condition or kind of make was a mistake or makes them second rate. So I'm delighted that my secondary school have invited me back to speak. Because I want to, you know, with one out of 10 people, they say in the UK, you know, working with dyslexia, you know, for those young people who are dealing with dyslexia, I want them to know that this is not a mistake, but this is by design. Yeah, It's still, I can't believe that, that dyslexia is still described as a learning disability. It's an insult. Yeah. You know, we're not disabled. Yeah. And it's not, I wouldn't even say it's a learning difficulty. I don't have problems learning. I just learn differently to other people. What I have and what other people like us have, we, we have a learning difference. And I object to it being called a disability or a difficulty. It's actually my strength. Yes. It's interesting. I often think of it as the school's disability. Mm. Because it, it's a, it is a disability, but it's not my disability. It's your disability to teach me the way I learn. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes people say, I suffer with dyslexia. I don't suffer with dyslexia. Society suffers because it doesn't have a good enough understanding of what dyslexia is. It's not a disability. It's not a difficulty. It's a difference. And I would really love to see initially just a change of language around how we talk about disability. I don't suffer with dyslexia. Society yeah. suffers because of a lack of understanding of what dyslexia actually is. It's a really hard one, Matt, because in order for people to get help, they've put it under this disability banner to force educators to take it seriously and adapt and so on from a legal perspective. And yet, from a personal perspective, it's like, hold on a minute, you know, because I think differently, you're calling me disabled, but I'm I'm perfectly able if I'm taught in the right way. Yeah, totally. I, I, I'm excited about going back to my school to speak, and I haven't worked out exactly what I'm going to say, but I do want to talk about dyslexia, because I want young people in that school who live with dyslexia to understand that, firstly, it's not a disability or a difficulty, it's a difference. And that difference is actually their strength and their superpower. You know, there are things that I realize there are things that I have uh, abilities in that I have those abilities because I'm dyslexic. You know, I mean, the classic one, isn't it, is problem solving and innovation and creativity. And I describe myself as a business and social entrepreneur. Because I'm phenomenal at coming up with new ideas, but not just coming up with ideas. That's the easy bit. But actually making those ideas work to solve problems for people and to create value for people. And that is a really incredible superpower. Um, we, we all know, you know GCHQ were well, and probably still are proactively recruiting people with dyslexia because of their problem solving abilities. And, you know, I, and, and there's a disproportionate number of entrepreneurs who are dyslexic because they just see the world differently and are able to bring slightly different solutions to problems and challenges that, that the majority of people don't see. And I want to encourage young people, you know, it's not a disability. This is your superpower. Yeah. This and make you and it's it's not the same for every but that that is a common skill that people with dyslexia have an ability to problem solve and innovate yeah how did you get over the emotional side of it you know you talked a little bit about that happening but could you give us a little bit of an insight in how that worked how you made that actually happen for yourself over time yeah yeah it, it did take time it wasn't overnight. You know, for me, I, I have a, personally, I have a faith that really helped me in that. And I have a belief in God. And, you know, my, my, my Christian faith believes that God is a God of love and God loves us unconditionally. But it was beyond that for me. It wasn't just that God loved me, but the fact that God actually liked me, that I found particularly profound. 
because of course we love everybody because we're meant to aren't we even unlikable people but if if but to actually like someone for me that's beyond love and so part of my the building of my self-esteem and acceptance of who I was was that understanding that God didn't just love me he liked me now I know that's very personal and not everybody would have a faith in that way but that's what really helped me on my journey the, the fact that I'm not just loved I'm liked mm. and that's that's been probably the most profound help for me in coming to terms with with who I am and accepting who I am and liking who I am so once you've done that what what kind of rewards do you think you've come out with from this experience you know what do you think the rewards have been for you yeah I'm passionate about helping other people and whether it's through the foundation neighbor or through publish you helping people write a book I just get such a buzz by helping other people achieve something they didn't think they could achieve and for me that's that's massive you know I've written I said I've written a few books and I can write a few more but actually I get a bigger buzz now not out of publishing my next book, but actually helping other people write their book. I had a guy who finished my course recently, and he said to me, Matt, I never thought I'd write a book, let alone in 100 days, but I have. Now I'm asking myself, what else have I told myself that I cannot do that I actually can? Fantastic. Me, that's game-changing. Yes. It's not just about the book. It's about our self-belief. You know, if I can overcome my self-belief that I'm stupid, then, you know, whatever self-belief anybody else has, they can overcome that as well. And if yeah. writing a book helps them, you know, believe that actually much more is possible than they'd ever dreamed or imagined, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, we'll pop in the link to your course and coaching on how to write a book in 100 days into the show notes. So if you're interested, swipe up and you'll see a hyperlink to it. Can I tell you one other story? Yeah, yeah. One of my one of the other authors that worked with me and became published, they sent me a message one day and they said, oh, my son, he was like nine years old, has just asked me if I, I would send this to the publisher, by which he meant me. So he's observed his mum doing the writing my book course and then getting her book published. As this nine-year-old boy... He decides he wants to write a book. So he draws, he writes, he staples it together. And then he asked his mum, mum, please will you record me reading my book so you can send it to the publisher, me. So she sits there and records this nine-year-old boy reading the book he's written on video so she can send it to me. It may sound a silly story, but I think it's actually quite profound. Because not only do I get a huge buzz out of helping people write their books, but I'm aware that there are children growing up in homes where now writing a book is normal. My mum wrote a book. My dad wrote a book. I'm going to write a book. I mean, it's, it's a mind shift, isn't it? It is. So not only am I going to help 10,000 people you know, write a book, but I'm going to help hundreds of thousands of children grow up in homes where for them writing a book oh but well, that's that's normal my mum did that or my dad did that I expect to do that myself at some stage fantastic this podcast is sponsored by dyslexiaproductivitycoaching.com it's my day job when I'm not hosting this podcast tell me do you know what you want to achieve in the workplace but you're struggling with how to achieve it maybe you suspect some traits of dyslexia are getting in the way well, that's where Dyslexia Productivity Coaching comes in because we give you a simple productivity system for your Apple devices that harnesses the creativity that comes with your dyslexia. It includes proven methods like note-taking, reminders, speech-to-text, mind mapping, and more, all tailored to your needs. It'll free up your time and help you achieve outstanding results. Book a complimentary call to discuss it with me. And if you do it soon, I may also be available to coach you personally via Zoom. So don't be shy. Go to dyslexiaproductivitycoaching.com or swipe up and book it now. 
Dyslexia and entrepreneurship seem to go very closely hand in hand for many, many people. There was a study done in the UK where 40% of entrepreneurs were dyslexic and the average in the UK is around about 10%. So it's much higher than normal in entrepreneurship. So what, what are your thoughts on entrepreneurship and its role in society and also dyslexia as well, you know, this kind of thing? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it's something I'm very passionate about. We are living in a global cost of living crisis, and it is global. It's not just, it's every country. And I travel, so next week I'm in Romania, the week after I'm in Italy. I mean, I travel many places, and everybody I meet in every country I go to is struggling with the cost of living crisis. So where is the solution to the cost of living crisis? If anybody listening thinks the government can fix the cost of living crisis, you might be waiting some time. Because from my perspective, whatever political party is in government, there is no amount of taxation they can raise that will fix the cost of living crisis. Neither can charities. I mean, some charities claim to end poverty. There's, charities are not able to end poverty. No amount of money that they raise can run enough programs to solve poverty. Because financial hardship, the cost of living crisis, cannot be solved by government or charity. The only solution to economic hardship is enterprise. You know, we have to, from my perspective, I'm encouraging people to take agency in your lives. Take off your victim mentality. Stop blaming other people. And I'm, I'm just saying that with kindness, because I, I know I can blame other people. Let's take responsibility and say, actually... If the world is facing this cost of living crisis, then what can I personally do about it? Could I actually start a business that creates an income for me and for my family? And potentially, could I create a business that could create some jobs for other people? Because it's only enterprise that can create a lasting solution to poverty. You know, government welfare and charity handouts will not solve poverty or the cost of living crisis. Only enterprise can do that. And this, And you're saying this as a person who leads a charity as well, so that there is yes. a place for charity, and there is a place for government, and there's a place for enterprise. Yeah, I've been a councillor in local government. I'm the founder and chief executive of a global foundation. And there's a very important place for politics, for charity. I mean, yes, government creates the environment you know, for us to freely work in a, a just environment, the rule of law, public order. They do many things. But government government struggles to fix a lot of things. It certainly ain't going to fix the cost of living crisis. Charity, I mean, there's a very important role for charity to help people at moments of crisis and who are experiencing vulnerability. I wonder, Matt, if you've got any thoughts on technology that's emerging, like AI at the moment is a big deal. Like I've been talking to people about chat GPT and other AIs and their role in society and enterprise and so on. Um, and also their role with dyslexia too. You know, for example, I'm using chat GPT a lot, not to write my material, but to sort of sometimes clarify certain questions and break down sort of a bullet point list of possible kind of areas that would answer it. And often I kind of think of ChatGPT as my neurotypical assistant. You know, it's like I'm thinking in one certain way and I'm like, how would I explain all of this random thoughts and so on to someone typical, you know, sort of thing. I don't say it like that. And then it comes out with my same words, but structured and organized and cleaned up and grammar cleaned. And I go, Yes, that's how I'd explain it to a typical thinker. <laughs> um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on this AI revolution that is coming yeah. our way? I mean, if you haven't used chat GDP, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, it's amazing. I, I love it for research to ask it a question and see what it comes up with. And it might come up with a stream of thought that I hadn't thought of. Um, you know, and for my mind, that like you know, my mind is sometimes jumbled with thoughts. You know, it does an amazing job of you know, creating a structure around those thoughts. So I haven't got a great deal of experience of AI, but I think some of these AI tools are going to help us change what we most value 
in people. Because if AI can do what we educate people to do, then what's the point of education? You know, and one of the strengths that is often prominent in people with dyslexia is emotional intelligence. You know, AI, well, as far as I'm aware at the moment, doesn't do emotional intelligence. It's a human experience. And perhaps our educational development should be focused a lot more around our social awareness, our, our personal awareness and our social awareness and actually developing our emotional intelligence. Because just being able to read a book, memorize it by rote, spill it out in a series of arguments in an essay and an exam, big deal. I mean, I know, I know that's a lot of what education is built around, but if you can have AI that's going to do that for you, why bother, you know? I think what we're looking at is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Because, you know, knowledge is, you've got lots of knowledge about a particular thing, whereas wisdom is the ability to know when and how to do something. So know the right timing of something, know the right thing to do at the right time and in the right way. And that's still knowledge, but it's a particular type of applicable knowledge. And I think that's the what we're going to start seeing emerging with AI is lots of knowledge, but it's like, can you actually execute on this? Do you know when the right time is? Do you have discernment and ability to go out and get things done, etc.? And that's where wisdom comes in. And I think we'll start seeing the difference between knowledge and wisdom becoming much clearer in ourselves. And it's a great way of putting it. Yeah, and, and wisdom at its heart is how you deal with people, isn't it? It's how you take what you think is truth and you make it work in a community between relationships, in government, in policing in, in, in classrooms. I mean, how do you take what you think is true and make life better for people? So I, I think that's a great way of seeing it. Great way of seeing it. I think we're going to see a huge change in the way that dyslexia and neurodiversity are perceived and seen by society. It's long overdue. But I'm not going to complain about the past. Let's just work on the future. I think we're going to see a big shift and with people with dyslexia and neurodiversity being more likely to be entrepreneurs, we need more entrepreneurs in, the, in this context of the cost of living crisis, where it's going to become increasingly difficult for an increasing number of people with no quick fixes. Actually, what we need is to encourage people who have an ability to create something out of nothing or to create a lot out of a little. And that's what an entrepreneur is for me. Somebody can create something out of nothing and take that risk, or somebody can take the risk to create a lot out of a little. And people with dyslexia are far more likely to be able to do that than people who don't. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So this is my journey, and I'm still on the journey. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm still learning, I'm still discovering. But during the pandemic, I decided, Matt, you are an entrepreneur. Yeah, Eating around the bush. You may not have built something big or made lots of money, but that's not what defines an entrepreneur. If an entrepreneur is somebody who takes a risk to create something out of nothing, then gosh, I'm an entrepreneur. I start so many things. Some of them work, some of them don't work. If they don't work, I wrap them up as soon as possible and, and try and pretend they didn't happen, learn from them. <laughs> and if they work, put more resources into it, let it grow. Yes. So before we go on to the future, I'd love to ask if you don't mind about family, because often the story of dyslexia is not just the story of one individual, because our minds are passed down through generations, you know, where it's inherited. And so you can have generations of families who are, have dyslexia in the family. Have you experienced any dyslexia through, once you become aware of it upwards and downwards? Yeah, yeah. I've got three children and uh, one of them is dyslexic like me and they've struggled through school. And I've constantly encouraged them and said, look, your school experience does not define your life. It's important, but it is not the be all and end all. So don't let how well you do at school determine whether you're smart or stupid, because you're actually very smart. This is not the be all and end all. And you have amazing abilities. Let's focus on those. And, you know, I've done my best. <laughs> I think, I hope 
they have a higher level of self-esteem at their age than I did at when I was the same age. And, and I hope that by becoming aware that they're dyslexic earlier than I did, they will have the advantage of seeing it as an advantage. And, I, and I've encouraged them, don't get a job. Make your own job. Be an entrepreneur. Don't work for anybody else. Create your own job. Create jobs for other people. Now, I don't know if they might go and get a job for a while, but I find really hard to counterbalance their... And I don't want to be negative about education, but it's been a damage limitation exercise for my child. We've just tried to manage them through school, trying to limit the amount of damage it's going to do to them because it has done damage to them. And for them to come out the other side still believing that they are a smart person who's got incredible prospects in life and will go on to do great things. So don't be defined by education. And that isn't to diss education, but we need to wake up and smell the roses. You know, our education system is built for one sort of neurointelligence. But for many, the other things are just viewed as a disability. And as we've talked about, and a difficulty. You know, come on, let's get real. It's just nonsense. I wonder if this AI, and I know I keep talking about it, but it's going to be massive, absolutely massive. And I think as to think as leaders of our families, of our businesses, we've got to be thinking in advance of it so that it doesn't hit us as a tsunami. We are riding that wave and guiding our businesses and lives with that power in some way. So what I've noticed is that AI is going to force education to start examining whether someone actually understands what they're learning. And that's one of the interesting things. I work with students with dyslexia, as well as adults with dyslexia, to teach them how to study and learn with mind mapping. And I mostly do it for adults now. But what's interesting is that often people with dyslexia actually understand the subject, but they don't necessarily know all the detailed facts and figures and so on. So if you tested them on the subject, they might not pass. But if you actually gave them a project to do on the subject, they do an amazing project on it. They build a business around it or whatever. It's kind of like, it's interesting. Uh, there's stories about NASA engineers. NASA proactively hires people with dyslexia and also autism because they've got different skill sets in terms of their the way that the, pic, the big picture for dyslexia and autistics often very zoomed in and focused and they balance one another. And so a lot of NASA engineers can't remember the code of a particular nut or a bolt. They're like, give me the N7635, please. You know, that, that's not their level of knowledge, but give me the big long one thingy, you know, and they'll use kind of, you know, beginner language. But these are top NASA scientists who are like, yeah, I can't remember the name of the thing, but I know what it looks like and I know what it does and I can do it expertly and I can design it expertly. And, and so you see that nuance happening in real life. And whereas in school, it's like, well, you don't know your subject. If you don't know the exact name of that bolt, you can't be doing it right. And you're like, hold on a minute. The guy who actually designed the thing <laughs> might not even know the name of the, the code or remember it, but he, he understands it on a higher level of principles and functions and processes, etc. And I think we're going to be forced by an AI, which knows all the gubbings and the details and so on, to find ways to say, do you actually know what you're talking about? And then maybe you reorganize a system of education to actually encourage people to actually understand what they're learning. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I think it's so, so true because often, you know, in education, intelligence is measured by the ability to write an essay on the subject. Mm. It's not actually about knowing the subject matter. It's actually about writing an essay. Can you write an essay? Yes or no? It's, it's kind of it's ridiculous. Yes. And so I, I think I really want to see a more diverse way of measuring whether we know what we need to know rather than writing essays. Yeah. I, I, I can visually, I can see the future. I can work towards the future. Visually, I can understand a problem and break it down and find a solution. 
but I can't do it in an essay. Oh, talking about can't do it in an essay, <laughs> business plans. What are oh. your thoughts on business plans? <laughs> Waste of time. The only people who ever want a business plan is the bank. And there, there, are, there are different sorts of business plans. A lot of my business plans are written on wine mats or beer mats. That's where I write my business plans, you know. Uh, and then I, actually, I do. I have got a two-page enterprise plan, I call it, which just helps me frame out a business and helps other people frame out a business. You might want to produce a pretty pitch deck with lovely photographs, but minimal writing, you know, it's just got the headline thoughts. If you want to raise some money from private investors, but it's only big financial institutions that want a business plan. And what do they know? So, I mean, there is a place for business plans. I don't want to mock them, but. Yeah, I agree. Have you come across the business model canvas, by the way? No. It's it's a fascinating one page business plan that's visual. Yeah. And uh, it's become really quite popular in a lot of places. And I think to myself, gosh, that's a very dyslexia friendly way of doing a business plan because you can see everything in one page. You can see the process and the flow and so on. I loved it when I saw it. So Matt, what's the future? What's happening? What, where do you see things going in the future? Talk about a bit of your future. For me, this year, I've decided to become very vocal about dyslexia and some of the things we've talked about today. I want to tell my story. I want to challenge language. I want to challenge culture. I want to challenge education. Going back to speak at my school, I'm looking at how we can influence the education system. I'm, I've written for one of the broad sheet papers about dyslexia. We publish soon. It's great to be on this broadcast. I'm using every opportunity I have to advocate for a greater understanding for people with dyslexia, for people with dyslexia to encourage them. You are smart. You are, you have a superpower. And for people who aren't, to help them understand that people with dyslexia are smart and they do have a superpower. And, and that's, that's what I'm passionate about. I'd love to become an ambassador for a dyslexia charity. I'd love to, you know, just push this through. I'd love to encourage more people to start a business. I think it's what we need during this cost of living crisis. You know, if, if things are tough, let's not wait. We can't look to charities to fix it or government to fix it. Let's start businesses that generate what we're lacking, which is cash. Um, so these are the things that I'm pushing into. And Publish You, you know, I want to help another 100 people become published authors this year. We're publishing now four books a month for people that have done my course. So for me, that's what this year is about. How many of them do you know have got dyslexia? Because some of them must have dyslexia. Do you know? Yeah, I mean, of 100, I guess at least 10 would have dyslexia. Have you um, asked? I haven't. Do you know what? As a result of this, Doris, I'm going to start asking people whether they have dyslexia or not. Yeah. Uh, because it would be very interesting to find out. Be. Yeah, yeah. I, it would be fascinating to find out the, the hundred you've done already, or a couple of hundred, I'm not sure, but more than a hundred you've done already, to just go and ask them, you know, by the way, I'm raising about awareness. I'd love to know if you had dyslexia. And I bet you some of them come back and go, well, never told anyone, but it was a big thing for me to write this book, but I, I am dyslexic, or I think I'm dyslexic. Yeah. Well, I've got a couple of online communities. So this weekend, I'm going to go on and ask them, Doris. I think it's a great idea. I would be very interesting to know the percentage of people who think they have dyslexia, who I've coached or, or have published. And I'm wondering what what's motivated you just in the last year to be more vocal and, and proactive on it? Was there anything in particular? I think it's seeing the experience of one of my children I talked about earlier, seeing the damage that school has done to them, uh, yeah. supporting them to get through, you know, as best they possibly can. That's motivated me. It makes me, makes me a bit angry, if I'm honest. Um, so that, that's been a big motivator. But also, you know, just this book venture that I'm on, seeing people do something they never thought they could achieve has just given me such a buzz and to see the impact it has for them and their children. So I would actually, I am seriously going to go away and find out how many people I've worked with so far have dyslexia. It'd be a very interesting thing to find out. But those have been the triggers for me. My daughter, very personal experience. And also, you know, coaching other people with my dyslexic methodology yeah. for writing a book. <laughs> yes. 
actually talking about the methodology of writing your book, we don't need to go into all of it, but is there anything particularly that you would think is quite unusual and dyslexic or, or lateral about the way you've done it that, that can intrigue people? Yeah, the first thing I get people to do, or one of the first things I get people to do on the course is write what I call the BCP, the back cover paragraph. So don't start with the introduction or the first chapter or the conclusion or the contents list. No, start with the back cover paragraph. And you answer three questions in 50 words total. Who's this book for? What's it going to tell them? And how is it going to help them? So that's one of the little methods I use. And it's what I use when I write every book yeah. that I write. Start actually at the end, because that sets your GPS setting, sets your true north for the rest of your writing journey. And if you feel you get lost or distracted or waylaid upon the way, you just come back to the true north. Brilliant. That is so big picture, isn't it? I mean, you're a big picture thinker. We're big picture thinkers. You've set the big picture. Not only is it the big picture, but it's also a focus picture in, in at both at the same time, you know? Yeah, I, I love to approach problems slightly differently. Yes. So this is a bit of a wild card question. I'm sure you're totally up for it. But it's if I could send you a card into the past, okay, and it had some greeting card in an envelope, and I could send it to Matt in the past, young Matt, what would it say on the front of the greeting card? And what would it say on the inside? And at what time would you send it to yourself? Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, you know, I'd probably want to send it early. I remember some of my school reports literally said, Matt won't, or Matthew, as I was called then, Matthew won't come to much. That sticks. It does. I had them as well. And so I would want to send this greeting card to myself, I think, at the start of my education. How old would you say? You know, at six, seven, you would send the card? Yeah. To... As early as possible. Okay. Yeah. Six so... or seven. Maybe not at four or five. Maybe not nursery, but okay. certainly start of, of primary school. Because that's when it started to impact me. Yeah. Okay. So five and a half year old Matt gets a, a card. That he can't read yet because he's got dyslexia. But <laughs> send <laughs> read it for him, or AI I will read it for him. <laughs> okay. And and what does it say on the front of the card and picture? On the front of the card, I think it would say, "You are super smart." And it would pro. I don't know. It'd have a have a picture of a superhero. That's what the front would. say that would get the attention of, of a six and a half year old, a superhero, and on the front it say, "Matt." Maybe even use my name, Matt, you are super smart. And on the inside, what would you send to yourself from the future? Something along the lines of your perceived disadvantage will be your advantage in life. All that teachers tell you is not good will actually turn out to make you who you become. And how can you say that to a six and a half year old child? I don't know. So maybe maybe I'd say respect your teachers, but don't take too much notice of them because you are super smart and will achieve incredible things that positively impact the lives of other people. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And if you were to give some advice to parents who have been through what you've been through a little bit with your children and you could rewind a little bit from that experience, what kind of insights might you pass on to them? Diagnose as early as possible. Get help as early as possible. And don't take your child's education too seriously. It does not define them. It will not define who they become. Great. And any final words, any final thoughts that you haven't covered so far, but you've been thinking, gosh, I might want to share that? I think I've covered everything, you know. I think there's going to be a major change in the way that our society views neurodiversity. And an, an education that gets on early, this will be to your advantage. Businesses, and they are, that get on early, this will be to your advantage. So let's move this thing ahead. Let's catch up on, on where we should be on these issues. 
Thank you, Matt. A pleasure. It's been great to be with you, Darius.